In the past, we have learned a lot about the link between inflammatory bowel disease and the inflammatory rheumatic conditions. And it's for both specialists, the gastroenterologist and the rheumatologist, important to know from each other because we have learned that a lot of inflammatory bowel disease patients, if it's Crohn or if it's UC, both might have in up to 30% uh, arthritis. And on the other hand, we know as rheumatologists that spondyl arthritis are often linked to a higher risk for developing uh, inflammatory bowel disease. And um, this is important to know. And therefore, if I have a patient with, uh, with the ankylosing spondylitis, for example, or psoriatic arthritis, and reporting diarrhea to me, makes a difference compared to a patient having lupus and diarrhea, or rheumatoid arthritis and diarrhea, or osteoarthritis and diarrhea, knowing that uh, diarrhea might be uh, the symptom of an underlying IBD in a rheumatic condition. And the other way around. So I would expect that gastroenterologists are more, let's say, sensitized to, to um, look more in depth to joint complaints, joint pain, etc., to uh, understand if there's arthritis or only musculoskeletal pain. When uh, talking about the link between inflammatory bowel disease and rheumatic conditions, of course, the most important entity is the spondyloarthritis. So ankylosing spondylitis um, and uh, psoriatic arthritis. So these two diseases are the main diseases linked to inflammatory bowel disease. And um, maybe you know that we have a challenge in the delay of diagnosis uh, of uh, underlying musculoskeletal inflammation in, in ankylosing spondylitis or axial SPA, how it is named right now, um, and psoriatic arthritis. And um, now is the question, how can a gastroenterologist handle these kind of symptoms? And, um, and when to refer to a rheumatologist, etc. So, um, and this is the interesting thing I learned here at the ECHO, that the gastroenterologist playing around with several questionnaires um, you, you can use later on to look for tick boxes who are positive or negative in your individual IBD patient. And if you have a, a several numbers of boxes ticked, then you have to refer it. And of course, these are the question of, of uh, inflammatory back pain, of stiffness, of loss of function, and all these things. And I think there are def several projects right now running in the gastroenterologist to select the best questions. There is one questionnaire with 38 questions, which is maybe a little bit too much for a referral strategy questionnaire. Um, but um, there was also a recent paper published in 2018 where they have defined so-called major criteria, red flag symptoms, uh, where a gastroenterologist should refer to a rheumatologist, which, is, which is, are those symptoms like, again, inflammatory, bowel, uh, inflammatory back pain, back pain in the night, uh, stiffness, joint swelling and joint pain. And I think uh, in the future we will have prospective studies to validate and re-evaluate these questionnaires, how they are feasible in daily practice. But at present there's no clear consensus what kind of screening. And if you ask me as a rheumatologist, of course, if we have a typical signs of arthritis, again, which is pain in rest um, and becomes better during movement, uh, back pain, low back pain in, in uh, male people uh, in an age between 20 and 45, for example. Um, all these are signs where you should at least think about referral. And then, of course, I would ask our gastroenterologist, like we have done it in the past with a dermatologist in psoriatic gastritis, to check the joints and look for swelling. So if we think about that uh, these immune-mediated diseases are, uh, let's say, a kind of syndrome, with, with having symptoms on different organ systems, on the musculoskeletal system on the one hand side and on the uh, um, gut system on the other hand side, is the question, is it the same? It's not. So we have some similarities, but keep in mind that most of the rheumatic conditions are kind of autoimmune diseases and uh, the uh, IBDs are inflammatory diseases and not a typical autoimmune diseases. But interestingly, especially those diseases who were linked to IBD, like psoriatic arthritis and axial SPA, are nowadays um, described as auto-inflammatory diseases and not as typical autoimmune diseases as well. So yes, 
it is a link, but it's not the same though, which is clearly demonstrated uh, by the fact that not all the drugs who are working properly in IBD are working in musculoskeletal system and vice versa. We know we have treatment options for ankylosing spondylitis not working in IBD and the other way around. The next question is, if we know that these diseases are linked to each other, then the question is, how will this influence our treatment decision either as a rheumatologist or as a gastroenterologist. And for me as a rheumatologist, of course, yeah, let's say we have so-called key criteria for what kind of drug will be selected. This is, of course, efficacy and safety in my individual symptoms. So having ankylosing spondylitis, I will choose a proper drug which works properly in these conditions and are safe in these patients. Um, but then, of course, afterward, we're then looking for comorbid conditions who are associated to the underlying rheumatic diseases. And then we are looking, if there are comorbid conditions present, is this product I try to choose uh, also effective in the underlying comorbid conditions? And this helped me in a second step to find in a kind of precision medicine, the individual optimal treatment decision. So for example, now we have learned that uh, for biologics, we have only in ankylosing spondylitis and axial SPA, uh, two options. One is the TNF inhibitors and the other one are the IL-17 inhibitors. Uh, we know that IL-23 failed in ankylosing spondylitis uh, in the clinical trials. So, and now if you have these two options, I know as a rheumatologist that IL-17 inhibition is at least as effective as a TNF inhibition in ankylosing spondylitis. But if an underlying IBD is present, we know that IL-17 has no positive effect, at least no positive effect, on, on inflammatory bowel disease, while a monoclonal antibody against TNF has a proper effect on these conditions. So in this individual case, I would say I start with a monoclonal uh, uh, anti-TNF antibody and not with an IL-17, for example. Um, it's the same for other comorbid conditions. And um, the other aspect, what we have learned is if we have a comorbid condition in an axial SPA or psoriatic arthritis, and I know that I have also a positive effect on an underlying bowel disease, then the adherence on the product is higher compared to those without. So by choosing a drug and for adherence and persistence of a product, the comorbid condition of IBD is directly influencing our treatment choice.